In our last program, we introduced the concept of enthalpy change. Today, I want to take a look at one of the methods we can use to measure enthalpy change, calorimetry. To do that, I'm going to consider a, sort of a, a simple example. Let's say you have an alcohol burner that's burning an alcohol such as methanol, and above it a test tube containing water with a thermometer. The heat generated by the burning of the ethanol or methanol, hopefully that will then warm up our water. In this case, our reacting system is the alcohol burner, and the heat lost from the, that burner will result in a change in its enthalpy. This is an exothermic reaction, so delta H here would be negative. Delta H also measures the molar enthalpy change, the heat from burning one mole of our fuel. If I want to determine the total heat evolved then, I need to know the number of moles of fuel that were burned. So the number of moles of fuel N and delta H all refer to my reacting system, in this case, the burning alcohol. The heat that's lost is going to equal to the heat that's gained by my water. The water's enthalpy as a result will increase. And we can measure that increase in enthalpy by measuring these variables. They include the mass of the water, the specific heat capacity of the water, and the temperature change of water. Specific heat capacity is a, a value that's 4.18 joules per gram per Kelvin. That's available in your IP data booklet. Water has perhaps one of the highest heat capacities of all substances. And I'm going to make a few assumptions in this experiment. First of all, I'm going to assume that all the heat that's generated goes into the water. Second of all, I'm going to assume that the properties of my water, such as its density and heat capacity, don't change much as it warms up. Let's look at how we can put these two ideas together. If we apply the law of conservation of energy, energy can't be created or destroyed. That means the total energy of the universe needs to stay the same. In this particular case, the energy of my system plus the energy of my surroundings, which constitute the universe, may must remain constant. And if they change, their total changes must total up to zero. So if I add these two together, it gives me the calorimetry expression. Let's use this now in a worked example. I'm going to burn some methanol down below, 0.56 grams. The data that I've collected here you see on the right is the temperature. So for the first two minutes I hadn't lit the burner. Then I lit the burner at the two minute mark and continued to heat it up until the six minute mark, at which point I blew out the flame. There's my operational equation and I've just rearranged it to get all the variables for the system on the left hand side and all of the surroundings on the right hand side. Let's look at how one determines the temperature change. At first glance you might think simply temperature change is final minus initial. So looking at my graph, 38 take away 22. But I can do better than that. If I go to the point at which I ignited the flame, which is the two minute mark, and if I go to the cooling portion of my curve from six minutes to 10 minutes and draw a line of best fit through those points, they intersect at about 43 degrees. This is a better indication of my temperature change because it takes into account heat losses that would occur during the four minutes that it was being heated. I'm going to use 43 then as my final temperature instead of the 38 that I might read off the graph. So my temperature change would then be that gap. Now a little bit more about what the meaning of temperature is. If we study any sample of liquid or gas or solid, we would find that the particles have a variety of speeds or a variety of kinetic energies. That's shown on this distribution graph you see here on the, uh, above. Temperature is a measure of the average kinetic energy that these particles have, indicated here by my dotted line. The dotted line would be positioned such that the areas to the left and to the right are approximately equal. If I warm up that gas, I now have the red line. What you'll see is I still begin at the same place with some particles that virtually have no kinetic energy but the graph doesn't quite rise as high. It sort of spreads out to the right. But the red dotted line is clearly a higher average than the blue dotted line. So this might represent 22 degrees and the red line 43 degrees. So temperature measures the average kinetic energy of the particles in a sample. Let's go back now to our equation and substitute in some of the values. So for my reacting system, I have 0.56 grams and the molar mass of methanol, which I can determine from its formula. 
Now, to get the mass of water, because it's water, its density is 1. So 80 cubic centimeters is the same as 80 milliliters. And the temperature change I can get from my graph. Now, I've converted that here into Kelvin simply because my specific heat capacity is measured in Kelvin. But one thing to note, temperature change, whether measured in Celsius or Kelvin, are the same magnitude. So I could simply have left it in Celsius and subtracted, and I would get the same temperature change in Kelvin. Rearranging and solving, I get negative 401,900 joules per mole. To convert that into kilojoules, which is the standard unit, I divide by 1,000. And the second thing I'm going to note is significant digits. My mass has only two, my temperature change only two, so I have to round this number to two significant digits, which would be around negative 400 joules, or as shown here, negative 4.0 times 10 to the kilojoules per mole. Note the negative sign that the burning is an exothermic reaction. Now, there's a few things that could cause our answers to go off. First of all, the literature value for this experiment is negative 706. I'm off quite a bit. If we take a look at the concept of percentage error, I look at the difference and divide it by my literature value. You'll notice here when I was determining the difference, I went back and I used negative 402, which is, a, which is my answer sort of unrounded, because I want to use the unrounded value here. But anyway, I finish up with a 45% error. Now, why am I off by so much? There's a host of things we could look at. First and foremost, in my assumptions, the assumption that all the heat goes into the water perhaps is the biggest source of air. To improve that, there's a few things I could do. One is perhaps mass the piece of glass, look up the specific heat capacity of glass, and employ the temperature change of the glass, and add that term as well to the surroundings. Maybe not use a glass test tube, use something with a smaller mass and a smaller heat capacity insulating the container. And finally, using a windscreen, perhaps, to reduce any loss or minimize my losses to the air. All of these are examples of systematic problems. They all lead to a value lower than what would be expected. Also, the literature value is given for complete combustion is indicated by a blue flame. So had I viewed any yellow flame as this was burning, I knew I would have incomplete combustion. So to again improve the situation, perhaps a smaller wick might improve the surface area and as a result combustion into a blue flame. Perhaps setting up a separate oxygen tank blowing through a rubber hose eventually through a glass tube near the flame itself could improve its combustion. But again, it's systematic because incomplete combustion would reduce the heat that I could produce. This experiment might not have been covered at standard conditions and the values that are quoted are for standard conditions. That could cause my values, experimental numbers, to go up or down slightly. And lastly, perhaps some water evaporated that I didn't account. I assumed that the mass of water remained constant. But if some water did evaporate, I could weigh the container before and after, find out the mass that was changed, and also incorporate some heat that went into vaporizing the water. And this too would be an improvement in my method. We're going to take another look at calorimetry in my next program where we look at mixing two solutions together. Thanks again for watching.